Life has been a string of tough breaks and a few love strikes. Losing my parents early hit me hard, like a sting that never quite goes away. But I got lucky when the elderly couple next door, the Parkers, took me in. They were the kindest souls you could imagine, treating me more like a granddaughter than a charity case. We weren't rich in money, but we were wealthy in love, and that's what mattered. Then, just as I was coming into my own, turning 18 and thinking about college, they died in a car accident. Just like that, I was on my own again. The Parkers left me a bit of money for school and their old house in the suburbs. It was a cozy place, full of memories but too many ghosts for me. So I sold it and bought a small apartment in the city near the college where I enrolled to study financial management. It felt good having a plan, moving forward. Classes were tough but interesting, and I threw myself into learning everything about numbers and markets. After college, I landed a decent job. Daytimes were packed with work, and I was doing all right. But nights were another story. The city felt lonelier than it should for a place so full. That's when I met Tom at a friend's party. He was loud, funny, and didn't care who knew it. His energy was infectious, and we hit it off from the moment he bumped into me, spilling my drink. Hey, watch it, I snapped, more out of surprise than anger. Whoa, I'm bad. Let me make it up to you. What were you drinking? Tom grinned, unapologetically. Just beer, I said, trying not to smile too easily. Two beers, coming right up, he shouted over the music, heading to the makeshift bar. That was Tom, all over. Simple, straightforward, and no fuss. We spent the whole night talking about everything and nothing. It turned out we both loved old movies and hated sushi. It was easy talking to him, and by the time the party was winding down, I didn't want to say goodbye. A year later, he proposed. No dramatic gestures, just him, me, and a ring he fumbled out of his pocket while we were watching TV. Marry me, he said, holding the ring so tightly I thought he might crush it. I laughed. I actually laughed. Not because it was funny, but because it was so typical of us, so perfectly imperfect. Yes, of course, you big goof. Getting married didn't change much at first. We were the same, just legally bound, which felt right. We settled into life together in my small city apartment, still close to the hustle, but now with someone to share the quiet moments. Life felt full, and for the first time in a long while, the evenings didn't feel so empty. Settling into married life had its comforts, but life sure doesn't let you get too cozy without throwing a curveball. Harry Spokes, Mrs. Dawson, were gems, living in their cozy suburban home. They welcomed me with open arms from the get-go. I could see where Harry got his easygoing nature. Their warmth was a balm on my often sore heart. So happy you're part of our family now, Mrs. Dawson would often say, squeezing my hand with a kindness that felt both uplifting and overwhelming. Thanks, I really appreciate how welcoming you've been, I'd reply, feeling genuinely grateful. Visiting then became our weekend ritual. Those days were filled with backyard barbecues and lengthy chats over cups of steaming coffee. Life was good, simple and honest. Until it wasn't. Harry got called away on a long business trip, a whole year of it. It was a fantastic opportunity for his career, but the timing was brutal. No sooner had Harry left than Mr. and Mrs. Dawson's health took a nosedive. It happened fast and Mrs. Dawson, bless her heart, sounded near out of her mind with worry which she called. Grace, I hate to ask, but I could really use your help around here. Mr. Dawson is really not doing well, her voice thick with unshed tears. Without a second thought, I packed a bag and headed to the suburbs. Seeing Mr. and Mrs. Dawson so frail shook me. He had always been a pillar, strong and steady. Now, he looked strong and tethered to his life through a maze of medical tubes. I slipped into the routine of their household seamlessly, handling the cooking and cleaning while Mrs. Dawson focused on Mr. Dawson's care. Evenings I spent sitting by Mr. and Mrs. Dawson's side, reading aloud his favorite classics, his eyes often fluttering closed long before I finished a chapter. Thank you, Grace, he'd whisper on good days, his voice a shadow of his former robust tone. It's my pleasure, really, I'd say, squeezing his hand, trying to offer comfort through simple touch. 
One quiet afternoon, Mrs. Dawson sat down at the kitchen table while I was chopping vegetables for dinner. She looked more older than her years. Grace, I don't know how to say this, but we're in a bit of a bind, she began, nervously wringing her hands. Mr. Dawson was the main earner, you know, and with him like this, I put down the knife, giving her my full attention. We're strapped, honey. I hate to even ask, but could you consider renting out your apartment? It might help us get through this tough spot. She looked down, clearly embarrassed. I didn't even hesitate. Of course, Mrs. Dawson. I'll get on it right away, I said firmly, trying to ease her burden. The apartment rented out quickly, and every month I dutifully transferred the rental income to Mrs. Dawson, along with money for groceries and whatever bills piled up. It wasn't easy. The commute to my job in the city became a nightmare. But a family sticks together, right? That's what I kept telling myself, even on the hardest days. You're a godsend, Grace, Mrs. Dawson would often say, her relief palpable each time I handed her the money. It's what family does, I'd respond, though some nights, as I lay in the guest room listening to the distant sounds of sirens from the city, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. Harry's calls were my only respite, his voice a tether to another life. How's it going, Kim? You holding up okay? His concern was always evident, even through the static of long-distance calls. We're managing. Don't worry about us. I'd force cheerfulness into my voice, not wanting to add to his stress. Life in the Dawson household took a drastic turn when Emily, Mrs. Dawson's daughter from her first marriage, showed up unexpectedly. The vibe shifted immediately. She had that kind of presence, like the cold breeze that sneaks under the door. I never really knew Emily well, but I had heard enough from Harry and even glimpsed her frosty relationship with Mr. and Mrs. Dawson during brief, tense visits. My days had already stretched thin, juggling long commutes to work and caring for Mr. and Mrs. Dawson, who were now driven and fading fast. Emily's arrival, however, added a whole new layer of tension. It was clear she was here to stay, making herself at home as if she owned the place. One evening, after a particularly grueling day, Mr. Dawson beckoned me to his side with a weak gesture. His voice was a hoarse whisper, strained and urgent. Grace, you need to watch out for Emily. She's a very bad person, he said, the gravity in his tone pulling an invisible tight knot in my stomach. I understand, Mr. Dawson. I'll be careful, I promised though I wasn't exactly sure what I was promising against. True to Mr. Dawson's warning, Emily wasted no time establishing her new regime. The first sign was my finding her in the kitchen one morning, her presence like a storm cloud over the breakfast nook. Just so we're clear, I'm not here to play housemaid or chef for anyone, she declared, her tone sharp as she sipped her coffee, eyeing me like I was an intruder in her mother's kitchen. I was taken aback, but managed to keep my cool. Okay, Emily, I have been handling things so far, and I can keep at it, I said, trying to keep the peace. Could be, because I don't plan on lifting a finger. This is mom's house, after all, she snapped back, her eyes daring me to challenge her. From that day on, Emily made sure her presence was felt, and not in a good way. She ordered takeout just for herself and her mother leaving their empty boxes on the table for me to clean up. Her disdain wasn't subtle, and it stung. But I swallowed the bitterness because Mr. and Mrs. Dawson needed peace. Grace, why don't you sit and eat with us tonight? Mrs. Dawson asked one evening, a rare moment of old warmth in her voice. Before I could respond, Emily cut in sharply. Mom, Grace has been busy all day. She probably prefers eating later. Her words were coated with fake concern, but the message was clear. I wasn't welcome. The days grew heavier, my chores doubling. Emily's entitlement filled every corner of the house. I'd hear her at night, whispering with her mother, turning her against me with poison words. Mrs. Dawson, once so kind and understanding, started to change too. Her looks were colder, her thank yous fewer. A couple of weeks later, Mr. Dawson was gone. The funeral was a somber affair. Harry flew in just in time to say his goodbyes. It was the first time in months we were together, 
and the relief of having him by my side was palpable. Yet, in the morning, I noticed the air had shifted significantly at the Dawson residence. Emily was on her best behavior, treating everyone with forced politeness. How's everything been while I've been gone? Harry asked me quietly during a brief moment we had alone after the service. Fine, everything's been fine, I lied, forcing a smile. I didn't want to burden him further. His grief was enough to handle. Are you sure? You look a bit worn out, he pressed, his brow furrowed with concern. It's just been busy, you know, helping out around here. I reassured him, avoiding his gaze. It wasn't the time to delve into the mess that was brewing beneath the surface. As soon as Harry left, Emily dropped her act. The mask of the dutiful sister was gone, replaced by the sneering, dismissive attitude I'd grown accustomed to. The dynamic in the house shifted drastically. Mrs. Dawson, perhaps in her own throbbing grief, became distant and cold towards me. Commands replaced conversations and I felt more like an intruder than a family member. Emily took over the household as if she were the lady of the manor. Her reign was marked by disregard for anyone's feelings but her own. She started barging into my room without knocking, rummaging through my things as though searching for buried treasure. One afternoon, I was out in the garden, trying to find some peace. My eyes stumbled upon a box lying among the shrubs. Curiosity peaked, I opened it only to find my watches, jewelry, and even some underwear. My heart sank. Nearby, draped carelessly over a bush, were several of my dresses. Fury bubbled up inside me as I gathered my belongings. Clutching the box, I stormed inside, finding Emily in the living room, lounging as if she owned the place. What the hell, Emily? I demanded, my voice choking with rage. You can't just throw my stuff out. Emily laughed, a cold, harsh sound that echoed mockingly around the room. Live here? Please, you're just a guest, and not a welcome one. You should be out in the garden, or better yet, on the street. You're nothing but a ruthless beggar, anyway. Her words stung like salt in a wound. I couldn't believe the venom in her voice. Trembling, I turned to Mrs. Dawson, who had just entered the room. Mrs. Dawson, please, tell her she can't treat me like this. This is supposed to be my home too, I pleaded, my voice cracking. Mrs. Dawson, once kind and gentle, now looked through me as if I were glass. This is Emily's house now. She's right, Grace. Maybe it's time you found somewhere else to live. Her words were a blow I hadn't anticipated. I stood there, the box in my hands, my heart breaking in my chest. The home I had come to know, the family I thought I had, crumbled around me in that instant. Despite everything, I stayed because of a promise I made to Mr. Dawson on his deathbed, to look after his wife and not let Emily overpower her. Day by day, Mrs. Dawson seemed to adopt Emily's cruel traits. Her words turned sharp, her eyes cold. You're just sitting on your hands here, aren't you? Mrs. Dawson snapped one evening as I cleaned up after dinner, her voice dripping with disdain. I'm doing my best to keep things running smoothly, I replied trying to keep my voice steady despite the hurt her words caused. Best? Could have fooled me. Seems like you're just freeloading, she scoffed, turning her back to me as she left the room. Her words stung. I was far from a freeloader. I had rented out my apartment and transferred nearly all that income to Mrs. Dawson, on top of handling most of the housework, while Emily did nothing but criticize. Emily, living off her mother's pension, was relentless. Really, what does my brother even see in you? She would taunt me nightly, her voice loud enough to carry through the thin walls. I'd bite my tongue, swallow the anger and frustration, and remind myself of the promise I made. But the atmosphere was suffocating, the house a minefield of hostility. One evening, coming home early from work, my world tilted on its axis. I walked into hearing Emily and Mrs. Dawson in the middle of a heated discussion in the living room. Noticing my arrival, I overheard Emily say, We need to get her to sell that apartment of hers. You know how much we could use that money? Yes, but how do we convince her? Grace is no fool. She won't just hand it over, Mrs. Dawson replied, her voice a mix of frustration and greed. Leave it to me, Ma. 
I'll sweet talk her into it. Once she sides it over, we can finally live the way we deserve. Emily's words slithered through the air like a snake. Hearing the plot to strip me of my only financial security was a cold splash of reality. Fear gripped me. I couldn't stand it anymore. My heart pounding. I slipped away to my room unnoticed. They were planning to rob me of everything. The decision was made right then. There was no staying after this. Hurriedly packing my essentials, my hands shaking, every second in that house now felt like a countdown to disaster. I didn't bother with goodbyes. They didn't deserve them. Slipping out the back door, I ordered a taxi to the station. Sitting on the train to Harry's state, doubts swirled in my mind. Would Harry understand? Would he take their side? The uncertainty was crushing, but the fear of what might happen if I stayed was worse. I stared out the window, watching the landscape blur by, a mix of fear and resolve settling in my chest. When I arrived at Harry's place, his reaction was a cocktail of shock, relief, and a swirl of questions. His eyes widened as he opened the door to find me standing there, my bag in hand, looking probably as frazzled as I felt. Grace, what are you doing here? Is everything okay? He asked, stepping aside to let me in. I hesitated, taking in the familiar, comforting sight of his temporary home. No, Harry, everything's not okay. Not at all, I replied, my voice catching a bit. He led me to the couch, his expression now lined with worry. Talk to me, babe. What happened? He urged. I told him everything, starting from Emily's return the worsening conditions at home, the financial manipulations, and the final straw. The plot to make me sell my apartment. I hadn't wanted to worry him before, didn't want to add to his stress while he was away working. Harry's face darkened with every word I spoke. By the time I finished, his fists were clenched, his jaw set hard. Why didn't you tell me any of this before? He asked, his voice a mix of anger and concern. I didn't want to cause more trouble. I thought I could handle it, I admitted, feeling foolish now. Grace, damn it, you shouldn't have to handle anything like that alone, he exploded, standing up to pace the room. I can't believe my mom and Emily would treat you this way. He stopped and looked at me, his eyes intense. I'm not letting anyone treat my wife like that. No way, he declared, pulling out his phone. I watched, heart pounding as he dialed his mother. The phone barely rang twice before she picked up. I couldn't hear her words, but the stiffness in Harry's shoulders told me enough. Mom, this has to stop. I know about everything, and I won't tolerate it. If Emily doesn't leave, and if you don't start treating Grace with respect, then you can forget about us helping out anymore. No more money, no more nothing. Harry's voice was steel, not giving room for any argument. There was a brief, Fiery exchange, then silence. Harry's hand tightened around the phone. Fine, if that's your choice, then you've made mine, he said finally, and hung up. He turned to look at me, his expression softening. Looks like it's just us now, baby. That's all we need, he said, coming over to wrap me in his arms. I leaned into him, the safety of his embrace fortifying me against the whirlwind of emotions. Just us, I murmured feeling the truth of his words. We were on our own now, but somehow, that felt okay. Harry and I talked long into the night. We discussed practical things, like my remote work arrangements and our financial plans without the extra drain of supporting his mother and Emily. It felt like we were laying the foundations for a new chapter, just the two of us. Whatever happens, we're in this together, you and me against the world, right? Harry said with a determined grit right? I smiled back, feeling more confident with him by my side. Against the world. The next few days were a whirlwind of activity. I contacted my job to arrange remote work, which thankfully, they agreed to. Harry helped me move my things from storage and set up a home office in the corner of his living room. It wasn't perfect, but it was ours, and it was peaceful. A week into our newfound peace, I was jolted by a call that almost felt like a ghost from a past life. It was Mrs. Dawson, her voice once sweet to me, now dripped with a mix of desperation and audacity. Grace, 
Why haven't they received the money for this month? You know we depend on it, she demanded. Right off the bat, I was stunned, silent for a moment, her nerve unbelievable. I'm sorry that after everything, you really expect me to continue supporting you? I asked, my tone more incredulous than angry. In the background, I could hear Emily's voice, shrill and angry. She's just an ungrateful girl. Make her transfer the money. Taking a deep breath to calm my rising anger, I remembered the venomous words they had thrown at me. Words that stunned deep, Mrs. Dawson. Emily called me a ruthless beggar. Remember? I'm not sending money to people who treat me like trash. I'm done. There was a pause on the other end, and I could almost picture Mrs. Dawson's shocked face. But we're family, she finally said, her voice a mixture of anger and pleading. No, family doesn't treat each other that way. Goodbye, Mrs. Dawson, I said firmly, and hung up before she could respond. The call shook me, but Harry was right there, his support unwavering. You did the right thing, Grace. It's time they learned to stand on their own, he reassured me, wrapping an arm around my shoulders. Not long after settling back into our hometown, another surprise came our way. I was pregnant. The news brought a joy we hadn't expected, and suddenly, the future seemed filled with possibilities. We decided it was time to sell my apartment and buy a small house in the suburbs, a place near a good school where our child could grow up. As we were planning our move, another call came, again from Mrs. Dawson. Her tone was different this time, desperate, almost pitiful. Grace, I've made a mistake. Emily forced me to sell the house, took the money, and left me with nothing. Can I, could I come and live with you at Harry? Her voice was shaky, pleading. The request sent me really. After everything, this was the test of my resolve. Mrs. Dawson, you chose this path when you sided with Emily against us. You could have chosen differently, I said, my voice steady despite the turmoil welling inside. I know, I know, I've made mistakes, but you have a kind heart. Can't you forgive an old woman for her wrong choices? She implored. I sighed, feeling a twinge of pity but remembering the pain her choices had caused. I forgave you long ago, but that doesn't mean I can let you back into my life. You need to live with the consequences of your actions. Just as I have, I replied and ended the call. Then, with the resolute tap of a button, I blocked her number. We moved forward with our plans, purchasing a quaint house with a little garden where our child could play. It was a lazy Sunday morning the kind where you linger over coffee and the newspaper. I was flipping through the pages when a headline caught my eye. Staring back at me from the paper was Emily, handcuffed and looking defeated. Local woman arrested for massive fraud scheme. Look at this, Harry, I called out, holding up the newspaper for him to see. It's Emily. She's been arrested for fraud. Harry took the newspaper, scanning the article with a serious expression. Wow. Can't say I'm surprised, but still, it's a lot to take in. Yeah, it is. But she made her choices, and now she's facing the consequences, I replied, feeling a closure I hadn't realized I needed. The news of Emily's fate eventually drifted to us through friends that Mrs. Dawson was living in a tiny apartment, working two jobs to scrape by. Her pension wasn't enough to cover her living expenses and pay off the debt Emily had left her with. Did you hear about your mom? One of Harry's friends, Matt, brought it up one evening when they were over for a backyard barbecue. Yeah, I heard, Harry responded, flipping burgers on the grill. His voice held a trace of sadness, but was tempered with resolve. She chose her path, Matt. It's tough, but that's how it is. Matt nodded, understanding the unspoken boundaries. You're right, man. Just thought you should know. The conversation shifted after that, the evening air filled with lighter topics of sports and work. Life had moved on, so had we. The joy of our new life really crystallized when Mia came into the world. Becoming parents changed everything. It shifted our priorities, our dreams, it even healed some of the old wounds by filling them with new love. Can you believe she's ours? I whispered to Harry one night as we watched Mia sleeping peacefully in her crib. 
She is perfect, Grace. Just perfect, Harry murmured back, his voice thick with emotion. We spent our days marveling at each little milestone Mia achieved. Each smile, each giggle. She was our little miracle, and with her, the hardships of the past seemed to recede, making room for new memories, better ones. Each day was simple, filled with little moments of joy that stitched a tapestry of a happy family life.